that people have sent. So we start this week here with uh, the introduction of chapter 2, which is in paragraph 50. And then we get into a discussion of Revelation. So let's take a look at paragraph 50, and we can read that and then take a look at the in brief section as well. And if you don't have the Ascension version, it's the same numbering. So this is paragraph 50. By natural reason, man can know God with certainty on the basis of his works. But there is another order of knowledge which man cannot possibly arrive at by his own powers, the order of divine revelation. Through an utterly free decision, God has revealed himself and given himself to man. This he does by revealing the mystery, his plan of loving goodness, formed from all eternity in Christ, for the benefit of all men. God has fully revealed this plan by sending us his beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So again, picture this as a professor who's putting this together. And those of you who have taught, I'm sure, have gone through this as well. When you're teaching something, you tell your students what you are going to tell them, right? And then you tell them what they, you want to tell them. And then you told, tell them what you've told them. <laughs> so it's like three different uh, steps here, right? The first step is say, this is what we're going to discuss. Then you discuss it, and then you say, this is what we discussed. So that's what the catechism is doing as well. In this opening chap, this opening paragraph, we have all the key elements that are in this particular section. The natural reason, knowing God, uh, we can uh, go only so far, and then we have to rely on revelation. Then we rely on God's revealing mystery that is formed from all eternity in Christ. And God re fully reveals his plan in Christ by sending us the Holy Spirit. So let's take a look then at the in brief section here, which is on paragraph 68 through 73. It, by love, God has revealed himself and given himself to man. He has thus provided the definitive, superabundant answer to the questions that man asks himself about the meaning and purpose of his life. God has revealed himself to man by gradually communicating his own mystery in deeds and in words. Beyond the witness of himself that God gives in created things, he manifested himself to our first parents, spoke to them, and after the fall promised them salvation and offered them his covenant. God made an everlasting covenant with Noah and with all living beings. It will remain in force as long as the world lasts. God chose Abraham and made a covenant with him and his descendants. By the covenant, God formed his people and revealed his law to them through Moses. Through the prophets, he prepared them to accept the salvation destined for all humanity. God has revealed himself fully by sending his son in whom he has established his covenant forever. The son is his father's definitive word so there will be no further revelation after him. So you have this, this whole kind of presentation, and you can see an outline of this section in just reading the headings. The revelation of God. God reveals his plan of loving goodness. The stages of revelation. In the beginning, God makes himself known. He makes a covenant with Noah. He chooses Abraham. He forms his people, Israel. Then he sends his son, Jesus Christ, the mediator and fullness of all revelation. God has said everything in his word. There will be no further revelation. Okay, so you see that all of that fits together. You have an introduction that is telling you what that section is going to look at. You have the in brief that goes over the main points of that, and then... If you just look at the chapter headings, you'll see how that progresses from one to the other. Should we stop here now and, and look at any questions you have of this section before we move on? Mary?
why are we using mythic figures in the catechism, such as, such as Noah? So what, what is myth in scripture? Okay, myth is a way of telling truth. That's why we have mythic figures. This is the theology, in a sense, of the day, um, based on people who didn't have a historic background or scientific background or philosophic background. What did they think? And they tried to capture the essence of their experience with God in the stories they told. And one of the stories in the Near East at that time was the story of the flood that actually you can find even before Noah in a Sumerian eth epic called the Epic of Gilgamesh. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but it's, it's one of the great buddy uh, poems or epics of the world. It goes back thousands of years. It's about... Uh, Gilgamesh and his friend, I always liked his friend, his name was Inkadu. <laughs> like that, like that, Inkadu. They're sort of traveling around, and he's looking for God, and he's looking for meaning in life, and he's looking for everything that the human heart searches for. You know, this is an age-old kind of question. And one of the things that they talk about is a flood that wipes out all of creation and God saving the animals and the whole bit. And that is incorporated also in the mythic stories in the Old Testament. So Noah becomes a figure uh, that is representing all of humanity, if you will. And God is speaking to Noah and sending the flood because people had sinned and he's trying to cleanse the world. And then he en enters into this covenant with Noah. And this is the covenant that never ends, basically, that says God is saying, I will never leave you. I will always be involved in your life, basically. And I, I, you know, give you the sign of the bow, right? Many times translated as a rainbow. In Hebrew, it meant a, a bow, like in a bow and arrow. And where is the bow pointing? Not towards the earth. It's pointing to God, uh, according to the, the, the belief of that time. So Noah is a mythic figure, but sometimes when we hear myth, we think of, of, of untruth. But at that time, and looking at the biblical myths, there are a number of myths that we see in what we would call prehistory up to the call of Abraham. Uh, Noah is one of those, and the Tower of Babel is another one, and Adam and Eve in the garden and so forth. These are all attempts from the ancient people to try to get some understanding into their relationship with God and how God is relating to them. So that's basically why we have those figures. And that figure, Noah, is a very important figure because it's one of the first covenants established between God and humanity through, through Noah. The covenant that God establishes with people is everlasting. It doesn't stop. So we see these figures. Can you, you can think of other covenants, right? In what, what's one of the great covenants in the Old Testament besides Noah? Abraham, Moses, David, the prophets, on and on and on, until we finally get to the fullest of the covenant, which is Jesus himself. The covenants, you can see that it's a big difference now between a covenant and a contract. A contract is, you know, I'll do something if you do something for me. You know, you, you pay for a particular service, you pay somebody, and there's a, you know, laid out the, uh, the specifics of the, of the contract. You have to do this, that, and the other thing, and I will give you, or I will pay you, or whatever. And it's very specific, right? A covenant is a sharing it's an invitation to relationship. That's why when we talk about marriage, we don't talk it, about it as a marriage contract. We talk about it as a marriage covenant because it's a sharing of hearts. It's a sharing of relationship. And sometimes there may be, so you, you know, those of you who are married know that there is bargaining sometimes even in marriages. But it, it, your marriage is never 
defined by that bargaining. It's defined by the fact that you are giving your life to somebody else who's giving their life to you. So it's not something for something, it's a sharing of hearts, it's a sharing of lives. So the covenant that God enters into with people is a sharing of himself. And sometimes God asks for uh, a response for that. You know, I am your God, therefore you shall whatever. This first covenant with Noah, though, God is not asking for anything in return. He's saying, I will never send another flood to destroy the earth. In a sense, I will always be with you until the end of time. And that's a covenant that, that lasts forever as well. Yes, you're going to have to speak loudly so that I can hear you. Is Noah a real person? He's a real person in that myth. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, it's a bit, the genealogy, what genealogy are you talking about? That's from what gospel? No. It's from the gospel of Luke. Matthew's the genealogy starts where? With Abraham. Luke's starts with Adam and Eve. Why the difference? <clears throat> Matthew wrote for the Jewish people <laughs> to tie to the Old Testament. Yeah, Matthew is a Jew writing specifically or, or primarily for a Jewish audience. His, the importance for him is to trace the line back to the father of faith, to Abraham, right? Luke is a Gentile. He's trying to trace the genealogy back to the first parents, not just Abraham. <laughs> So anytime you're reading anything in, in scripture, you have to try to understand who's writing that particular writing, why are they writing it, writing it, and what audience are they writing it for? So you can see there's a lot of difference between, even in the New Testament, in, there's a lot of difference between Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel because Matthew was writing as a Jew for Jews primarily. Luke is writing as a Gentile for Gentiles. So even though there are some similarities in crossovers, you'll see a much more attempt on Luke's to make it more universal. So in his genealogy, it goes back to Adam and Eve, where Matthew's is going back to Abraham, the father of faith. You see that difference there. <laughs> No, we get the added the, all of those figures from the Hebrew scriptures, and the, he, the Hebrew scriptures were uh, were recognized as important by the Christians as well. But some Christians are going to be highlighting one section; other Christians are going to be highlighting another section. But the scriptures were already there before Luke and Matthew. Actually, the the central part of the, or the, the, the foundational part of the Old Testament, it's called the Torah, the first five books of uh, the Bible, called the Torah. They were actually put together or written during the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BC. They existed before that in little bits and pieces. But the Jewish scribes at that time that basically, I think, we, we can say the, the birth of modern Judaism during the Babylonian captivity. They collected all the writings. Why do you think it was important for them to collect the writings at that time? For those of you who know about the Babylonian captivity. Why? Okay, they had some influence from outside. But one of the main reasons was the temple was destroyed, right? The temple was the center of worship. 
the temple was destroyed, and people say, well, how can we be God's people now if we do, there's no temple? There's no place to offer sacrifice. Well, then we collect all the writings that, that we have. This is God working in and through us in the writings as well. It's not just in the building. It's not just in the sacrifice, but it's in the writings. That's when the Torah actually was collected. Various sections were, were collected in the Torah. And we have a, a beautiful reading. And I, I, again, my mind is going blank at the moment now, but... They have a beautiful reading in the Old Testament about the Torah being read for the first time on the steps of what would be the rebuilding of, of the temple. And the people cry, God hasn't given up on us. So it was a very powerful, powerful moment for the, uh, for the Hebrews at that time, or the, 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 the birth of the, the Jewish nation, if you will. Yes? Yes? Uh, the main point that she's making, for those of you who have trouble hearing in the back there, I'm sure, is that God has reached out to humanity for, for thousands of years, and not just to the Jews, but God has been reaching out to people over the centuries, represented in the, in the, the scriptures, in the, the account of the Magi coming to uh, Christ, the Gentiles coming to, to the Lord. Uh, so that, remember that this is something we talked about just in the first section of the catechism. It's God's search for man and man's search for God. So God is constantly trying to reveal himself, and we are always looking for the revelation of God as well. So you have that going back and forth. Yes. Wait, wait for a microphone. <laughs> okay, in my, that, see, there we go. Um, so the question I have is, we have Noah and we have Abraham who have covenants, okay? So I never really thought Noah was an actual person, but I know Abraham is. And I understand the word covenant with Abraham because he's an actual person that was handed and made this everlasting covenant with God and Abraham, between God and Abraham. But I never heard the covenant of, like, Noah is not a is the actual Noah in the myth is not a real person. It's a relatable person that was existed, we say, probably, right? Is that correct? Well, it's some, so somebody for the, for the people who represents all of humanity. Yeah, so it, it's within the, the mythic liter literature, if you will. And remember, uh, mythic literature in Scripture is an element of truth. It's a, a right. theological proposition, if you will. So for, for the people at that time, yes, Noah was a real representative of the people. Traditional speaking of it, what happened at that time. Yeah. That the covenant was made with this. Through, through this. yeah, God was making a covenant with the people represented, but represented by this figure of Noah. And that covenant is not mythical then. It is a real. The covenant is the important piece of it. Okay, uh, yes. Wait a minute, John. Hold on. Uh, I have a question. Uh, paragraph uh, 66. Uh, we're talking about uh, the pre Jesus Christ. The full revelation has been made, there's not going to be any further revelation. Right. Uh, and, and he said, yet even if revelation is already complete, it has not been made completely explicit. 
it remains for Christian faith gradually to grasp its full significance over the course of the centuries. Right. The second part of that sentence, I've read it and read it and read it. And <laughs> the full significance over the course of centuries? Please. Yeah, uh, it remains for Christian faith gradually to grasp it, its full significance. Can you give some color behind that? Sure, that's a, a question. If you can, maybe I could go to one of the questions because uh, that came up in one of the questions we had as well. So. Let me just switch over to that. These are some of the questions that I received for this week. We'll just deal with this one here. Maybe make that a little bit bigger here. This is in, in 65, which is right before 66. In the quote, St. John of the Cross says, In giving us his son, his only word, for he possesses no other, he spoke everything to us at once in the sole word, and he has no more to say. I can understand that Jesus is the fullness of revelation, not that I claim to fully understand this, of course. But the phrase, he has no more to say, came across to me as a limit that is being placed on God who is limitless. It seems a bit presumptuous to claim definitively that God has no more to say. I mean, he is God. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go on to that, that section as well. It's really focusing on the, on the, uh, the, the Catholic doctrine, dogma, if you want to put it that way, that Jesus Christ is the fullness of the revelation of God. He is fully God and fully man, right? We get into, we'll get into that with the creeds as well uh, when you get to that point of the development of the creeds. If Jesus is fully God and he is the word made flesh, then he is the fullness of the Godhead, right? There's no more to say above, over and above that because he is the fullness. He is the ultimate communication of the very essence of God. Do we really understand all of that? No, it's difficult to grasp the fullness of that. So over the centuries, as the church is praying about this and contemplating this and discussing this and dealing with misunderstandings. And you see that in the way that the, the creeds developed and the various councils developed as well. The church is saying, no, this is what we believe. You know, they come up with some uh, theological position. Church argues about it and then finally says, we need a council. You get the people together, leaders of the church, pray to the Holy Spirit for divine revelation, going right back to the first council of Jerusalem, where Peter and Paul were present. And we trust that the Lord will tell us the truth through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it, it, it reveals a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. The truth is, the fullness is there, but we don't have a complete understanding of that fullness until we wrestle with those, those kinds of questions. So we have the, the, what we, 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 we would refer to as the development of doctrine. You know, the, the doctrine that is developed can no, cannot be against what has already been revealed, but it's the f more of the fullness of what is yet to be revealed. And the fullness of the, that revelation can only occur when we are face to face with the Lord. So that's basically what that second section means there. Laura, wait a minute. Oh, I know. Believe me. <laughs> I feel so seen by you, Father. Oh, you. <laughs> uh, so can I take that to mean that the limitation is more in our capacity to understand than in God's the fullness of his revelation. Would that be a? I wouldn't say. I wouldn't necessarily use the word capacity. I would. I would. Present capacity. More. Get the our readiness. Oh. Our receptivity. Receptivity. Yeah. You know, the the revelation is there. The fullness of the revelation is there. But we don't have a complete understanding of that fullness, and we move to that as we go along in life, and as the church continues to deal with things. And, and you'll notice this, uh, the, even today, the culture that the church is dealing with today 
is much different than the culture it dealt with in the first and second centuries. The questions that we have today were never even thought of in the first and second centuries. But when they had a problem, what did they do? They looked at the Lord, they looked at the scriptures, they looked at the tradition, they wrestled with it, and they said, based on all of this and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is how we deal with this. That's what we do today as well. The questions that we have today, even the questions that well, I didn't have when I was a, you know, a kid. Uh, the questions that we had in the 60s, for those of you who remember the 60s, I don't think Father Zach remembers the 60s, <laughs> though he might like some of the music, hopefully, from that, that period. Uh, if we know that. I mean, the, the, the questions that are being raised by scientific research, by uh, human sexuality, by, 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 he go, go down the line, are not questions that the church has ever had to face. But we believe that we can reach a, a consensus of the truth about how we should live by the revelation that has already been given us and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that leads us more fully into the truth. Okay, so when we say that God has no more to say is because he's already said it, but we haven't heard everything. We haven't heard the implications of everything that that one word is. But we believe the fullness is in Jesus, who is the fullness of divinity. So that's the, the focus there. It doesn't mean that, that God stops speaking. God is always speaking. We're not ready to hear what he has to say until we ask the right question. And the society gives us a way of asking those, those questions and to uh, wrestle with it. Okay? Let's go back to, any more questions on this section before we go back? Yes. Would you expand a little bit on private revelation? Would I on, on private revelation? That's a private revelation. I can't get into that. Uh, now, a private revelation basically means, you know, if somebody like, uh, oh, I don't know, choose, choose a saint. Bernadette. And what was her revelation? The Immaculate Conception. Well, even before that, what was her revelation? I mean, that's part of, of what was happening there. That the, the apparition of, of Mary at that, that time. Um, the private revelation. Um, most of the apparitions are, can be, be called private revelations. They add to the richness of the faith, but they don't add to the faith. So, in, in other words, private revelations means that you do not have to believe that to be a good Catholic. Though if you do, it might be enriching for you. So, there are certain things that are, are the revelation of the, of the church that come in, in the doctrines and the dogmas that say, um, for a good Catholic, these are what you should be believing, right? And there's a certain uh, docility that is required to, to accept some of those but a private revelation is like with Medjugorje. Some people really believe that Medjugorje is a reality and they have gotten a lot of richness from that. Just as a, a little ad, uh, Father Zach's classmate wrote a book on that and you can check with him about that. That's available through Oxford University Press, right? And his name is... Daniel Maria Klimek. I can never pronounce his last name. That's why I have to. K-L-I-M-E-K. -E uh, he wrote a book. Uh, he did a doctorate in, uh, at Catholic University in D.C. And that was his dissertation. And he re rewrote it a little bit, uh, a little bit for Oxford University Press. But he is, uh, I think he's a genius. I guess you could say that, right? So it's hard right reading. It's very hard reading. But uh, anyway, that's private. Medjugorje is a private revelation. It could be enriching for you. And the church is basically saying in some, there's still some investigation of it. But for the most part, it's enriching. So there's nothing wrong with that. But to be a good Catholic, you don't have to believe it. So, you know, you can, you know, 
of a different kind of path. You see that kind of richness over the years, the, uh, particularly in the saints, have a particular relationship with the Lord. And we are all called to have that particular relationship with the Lord. And God might be revealing something to you in your life that you really want to hold on to and you believe it. God bless you. I hope that's enriching for you. But I don't have to believe it. It's more for the person. So that's why it's a private revelation as opposed to a public revelation or a dogmatic revelation. Okay? Okay, let's go back to our section here on the catechism. Now, we, we just looked at Article 1, the revelation of God. Then we look at uh, uh, Article 2, which is the transmission of divine revelation. We'll look at the introduction on paragraph 74. And then we'll, <clears throat> then we'll jump to the in brief section. So 74. God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth, that is, of Christ Jesus. Christ must be proclaimed to all nations and individuals so that this revelation may reach to the ends of the earth. God graciously arranged that the things he had once revealed for the salvation of all peoples should remain in their entirety throughout the ages and be transmitted to all generations. And if you notice at 31 there, that little uh, footnote, if you go down to the bottom of the page, that's a DV, which is De Verbum, which is a document from Vatican II on the Word of God. So we go from there to the in brief section, which is uh, 96 to 100. What Christ entrusted to the apostles, they in turn handed on by their preaching and writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to all generations until Christ returns in glory. Sacred tradition and sacred tradi uh, scripture make up a single sacred deposit of the Word of God. This is De Verbum number 10, in which, as in a mirror, the pilgrim church contemplates God, the source of all her riches. The church in her doctrine and worship perpetuates and transmits to every generation all that she herself is, all that she believes. Thanks to its supernatural sense of faith, the people of God as a whole never ceases to welcome, to penetrate more deeply, and to live more fully from the gift of divine revelation. The task of interpreting the word of God authentically has been trusted solely to the magisterium of the church that is, to the Pope and the bishops in communion with them. So we have that introduction. We have the conclusion. They're basically focusing on the same thing. It'll, and in between, there's a, a explanation of what that means. So just take, again, look at the titles. The Transmission of Divine Revelation. Apostolic Tradition the relationship between tradition and sacred scripture. They come from one common source, two distinct modes of transmission, apostolic tradition and ecclesial tra uh, tra traditions. The interpretation of the heritage of faith, the heritage of faith entrusted to the whole of the church, the magisterium of the church, the dogmas of faith, the supernatural sense of faith, growth in understanding the faith, and then the brief section that we had there. Any questions on that section? Okay. So I'm one. So I'm wondering on this number 100, the task of interpreting the word of God authentically has been entrusted solely to the magisterium of the church, that is, to the pope and to the bishops in communion with him. Right. Uh, what's your question? My question is, um, I'm a convert and came into the church 
after, shortly after Vatican II and uh, was raised in uh, the Methodist Church. And I used to hear people say before that time that people weren't really, Catholics weren't reading the Bible. They weren't like allowed to read the Bible because they didn't know how to interpret it. It was right. only the church that could do that. But since I came into the church at Vatican II, and I see this in this great, uh, especially in our church here, we have all kind of Bible studies. And uh, it seemed like a big turn in the thinking that, you know, we normal people, we can read the Bible and we can pray and ask Holy Spirit to help us understand what we're reading. So I'm just wondering, as I read that, if that is where that thought came from in the past, that people thought Catholics couldn't read the Bible. That opens up a whole interesting discussion. <laughs> uh, for those of us who are of a certain age, I'm sure you remember that that was what was occurring when we grew up in the 50s and in the 60s. Uh, it was only with Vatican II in a sense that it was opened up more. But we can see even with Pius XII, there's a, a document, I think, in the, in the 40s called Divino Aflante Spirito, uh, where he's talking about uh, modern scripture study, which led to uh, that beautiful document, De Verbum, uh, in Vatican II. If you haven't read De Verbum, I would really suggest that you do it. Um, I don't know if you realize, but uh, this... Uh, um, uh, Catechism in the Year has a Facebook page as well with uh, uh, a number of people in, throughout the country who are discussing this. And some of the questions are really quite interesting. They had uh, one person was saying, I was listening to uh, Father Mike, and he's always talking about this Dave Erbum. And I was wondering who Dave Erbum was. And it's D-A-V-E-E-R-R-B... I just, you know, I was looking for Dave, Dave Verbum all over the place, and somebody said it's De Verbum, the Word of God. But I just thought that was really quite funny. It was really beautiful. There was a time uh, after the Protestant Reformation. Um, so we're going back to, you know, Martin Luther and then the development of the, the various uh, uh, Protestant reforms and the fracturing, if you will, of the, uh, the Protestant uh, reforms into many different areas of the reform groups and very liberal groups and everything in between. But one of the rallying cries of that was sola scriptura, only scripture, right? So that's the only place that you look for the revelation of God is in scripture, okay? But then you had all these groups saying, well, this is what this, this scripture means, and this is what this scripture means. So you have a whole group that was formed around that. And then another group was saying, no, actually, this is what it means, and no, this is what it means. So you had a fracturing all over the place. And if you wanted to establish a different Protestant congregation, just get a building and say, no, I have, you know, Dave's church by the river. You know, the Holy Redeemer Church down the road. Or, or whatever. So you have all of this fracturing, and there's no central authority to say, hold on, that's not right. So the church, in a sense, at that time was saying, look at what's happening. We can't allow that. Reading scripture without understanding what the church is teaching us is dangerous. So people shouldn't do it. I might be exaggerating a little bit, but not much. So people shouldn't do it. I mean, we had a, this beautiful Bible on the bureau in, in, uh, as I was growing up that was kind of enthroned, if you will. And it had my parents' uh, parents' name and their wedding anniversaries and our baptism. And I don't think we ever opened it except looking at the pictures because it had some beautiful pictures in the middle. The Bible was about this big and it had these glossy paintings, you know, pictures of paintings of various biblical themes, and we'd sort of leaf, leaf through it, never read it. It's only with Vatican II, actually, with De Verbum, Dave, no, De Verbum, 
Um, so read that document. It's a beautiful document. It's very readable as well. I mean, a, a lot of church documents are difficult. Dave Erbum is beautiful. And it is really looking at what the importance of Scripture is. And that sort of opened up Scripture study. Uh, it, there was Catholic Scripture study beforehand. I mean, that, it's been going on for, for centuries. But it was reserved for theologians or scripture scholars. And it wasn't suggested for the faithful because, it, you know, look what happened with the Protestants. We don't want that to happen in the Catholic Church. Vatican II said, no, this is one of the sources of revelation, sacred scripture. The other one is sacred tradition. And the other piece of that is the magisterium. I had mentioned that before. That, that image of a, of a stool with three legs. And the only thing that's holding up that stool are those three legs, sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium of the church. If that's the case, then Catholics should really learn each of those legs, not just one. They should learn and embrace each of those with an understanding of the other two legs at the same time. So that becomes the challenge to understand scripture from the heart of the church, not just private revelation. So uh, you came at a time where that was opening up, and you can see the flowering of that with all the various scripture studies that are, that are going on. But all of those scripture studies should be done by looking at the reflection of what it means within the magisterium and sacred tradi tradition as well. Okay, yes. I just had a question on um, 92, the, the, the um, census fide or the supernatural appreciation of the faith. I, I guess what I'm, if I read it and understand it, what I think it's saying is that from the bishops and the whole of the faithful, that's where we get the truth and that can't be an error, but that doesn't mean that it's not evolving, correct? That, right. that, that we're not continuing to get gain more revelation, and as we gain revelation, that, that will evolve. Yes. It won't be an, it's not necessarily an error, it's just incomplete. Right, exactly. Okay, I just yeah. want to make sure. Okay, let me just get back real quick to the, some of the questions that were asked so that I can make sure we get through this part. Because I, don't, I could actually talk about this all day, but I'm sure you guys have other things you've got to do. So... Uh, Let's go to some, some of these other questions real quick. What the catechism is or isn't would be good for us to hear. Uh, I would, I'm just going to direct you to the, uh, Calf, the UCCB. This is the uh, U.S. Uh, Council of Catholic Bishops. And there is a frequently asked questions about the catechism here. What is a catechism? For instance, the Catechism of Texts containing the fundamentals of Christian truth, etc. Brief history of the Catechism, the purpose of the Catechism, for whom the Catechism is intended. Uh, let me see. What is the doctrinal or teaching authority of the Catechism? I just want to focus on that real quick. The Catechism is part of the Church's official teaching in the sense that it was suggested by a synod of bishops requested by the Holy Father, prepared and revised by bishops and promulgated by the Holy Father as part of his ordinary magisterium. So it's part of the ordinary teaching of the church. Pope John Paul II ordered the publication of the catechism by the Apostolic Constitution, P. De Depositum, on October 11th, 1992. An apostolic constitution is the most solemn form by which popes promulgate official church teaching. So you, see, you can go through, I, I won't read all of that to you, but go to the U, UCCS, the United, U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops, and uh, look, at, or you can just type in to a Google search, the authority of the Catholic Catechism, and it will direct you uh, to those, those sections. that will give you that, that kind of an explanation. Uh, let me get back here.
Excuse me. Other questions? The front matter, before the prologue, this is right at the beginning of the catechism. Uh, it says uh, the imprior potest, and what does that, that mean? Uh, this is basically a, a Latin that means it may be printed. It's a, a direct translation, it may be printed. And you'll see that uh, just right at the beginning, right before the table of contents in, in this uh, catechism, and you probably see it there as well. Right before the table of contents, up on the very top, it says, in primi protest, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, inter de Castro commission for the catechism of the Catholic Church. So in this case, it's signed by a cardinal. And in this case, he is the president of this group that put together the catechism. He is also, at that time, the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is the old office of the Inquisition, if you will. But they are the ones that are, are, you know, defined on whether something is worthy to be read, if you will. So this is Latin for, it may be printed. It refers to official permission uh, by a member of the religious order or the church to publish a work on a religious subject. It's, it is presented as being faithful to Catholic doctrine. So if you have that, there are other ways. that You see it in and Neil Obstadt, or basically those kinds of things as well, uh, that it is, it is, it's okay to read. It's safe to read, basically. And then the, the last question here, the fully revealed in, in Jesus, if God fully revealed himself in Jesus, then we should all be sure to understand the Gospels in English and Greek, what Jesus says, what Jesus does, so that we can think and act more like God would in today's world. Example, love vis-a-vis -vis, Agape, there is a huge difference in meaning. Basically, this is saying, you know, if, if we're, uh, I think it's saying, if we are going to be looking at, at Scripture as a pillar of faith, if you will, um, it is sacred Scripture, then it's important to try to understand the original. The original in Scripture is written in various languages, particularly the New Testament, in a Greek called Koine Greek, which is a kind of a common Greek at that, that time. And everything that we use is a translation. Every translation is an interpretation. So basically what we're saying, from what we know now, this is the best translation we have. But there's always language studies that are uncovering nuances of language. So the scriptures are constantly being revised so you have the New American Bible and you have the revised New American Bible. In a couple of years, you'll have a revised, 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 whatever, or some other name. Because as the language understanding increases, the translations are getting better and better and better. So it's always best if you want the Bible to get the, the most recent translation of the Bible because it gets you closer to the original meaning. Yes. Yes. Yeah, our language moves as well. Our language develops, so it's important for us to translate it every so often with you know the best language skills possible. What was being originally said and how can we best say it now? Fear of the Lord, as you, you mentioned, is one. You can translate it as awe, awe of the Lord. Because fear of the Lord in the context of what they say the wisdom, in wisdom literature, the first stage of wisdom is fear of the Lord. The way that when I studied Hebrew, our Hebrew professor, uh, pointed out basically what that is saying is you recognize that God is God and you aren't. That's fear of the Lord. You recognize who you are before God. You recognize God's place and you recognize your place. That's the first stage of wisdom. Another way of saying that would be awe of the Lord.
and the bishop, you know, the Pope and the bishops in communion with him. But you, 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 you're rising, uh, uh, raising. Did everybody hear that? Okay. You're raising a very uh, interesting point of discussion that has been going on for many years. Magisterium is the Pope and the bishops in, in, in accord with, with the Holy Father, right? Bishops don't agree. Welcome to the messiness of the church. Uh, there's also, a, this is something that for those of us who have studied uh, theology, it's always a question, well, what about the theologians? You know, you have some theologians that are, are raising some questions that the bishops don't even want to discuss. So there, there's always this, this kind of attention. Are theologians good, in, you know, the theologians in good standing? Why can't they be understood as being part of the magisterium, because they're the ones that are presenting the teachings. As a matter of fact, one of the, the presentations of that would be Vatican II. You had the bishops who were meeting with the Holy Father, but then you had the, what they call the Pariti, the theological experts, who are actually doing the writings, most of the writings of the documents. Some of the bishops and cardinals were involved as well, but you had a lot of the Pariti that were doing that. One of those Pariti became a bishop and cardinal and Pope Benedict XVI. He was one of the, the experts at, at Vatican II. Um, so that's kind of an open discussion. I don't want to get, get into a lot of problematics or whatever, but I agree that this, there's a lot here that we're, we're looking at the, the final result, but there's a lot of messiness as well. What Happened at Vatican II by John O'Malley. That's a book on, on some of those, those issues. It's, you know, sometimes, I hate to break this to you, but life can be kind of messy sometimes. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> yes. We certainly are. We certainly are. We're part of that messiness. So welcome to the messiness. Uh, Again, uh, as we continue, and I, I have this, again, just for your own information. I'll go back to here. The discussion email is ciy at gscc.net. So as you're reading during the week, if you come up with anything you would like us to discuss, just put it in here and send it to me, and then we'll open it up for any discussion. Yes. Is this being videotaped? Yes. It is going to be on our YouTube channel because um, there was a, some discussion last week. Can we do this some other time? And just trying to schedule something else is very hard. And we have a good number of people here, which is, again, a pleasure and really quite a pleasant surprise as well. But we want to give other people the opportunity. So those of you who are watching on the video, use the email, ciy at gscc.net, if you have any questions that you would like us to discuss as we're getting together here. Okay, so why don't we just say a prayer together to conclude. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go and read some more. <laughs> <laughs>